Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to wherever you're joining us from today. I'm Virla Nowen, Senior Research Fellow for Asia Studies and Head of the Indo-Pacific Program here at RUSI in London. I'm delighted to welcome you all today to the first of a four-part series uh, on security in the Indo-Pacific, which we're organizing as we head towards the end of the year. We've seen a great deal of tension in the region of late from an uptick in Chinese and Russian worship movements near Japan to reports that Chinese fighter aircraft fired flares and chaff at uh, Australian maritime patrol aircraft above the South China Sea, as well as Canadian aircraft flying as part of UN sanctions missions over the East China Sea reportedly also encountering what has been termed unprofessional PLA Air Force behavior. And of course, also China's recent live fire drills around Taiwan. Looking ahead, in mid-October, China will hold its 20th Party Congress, uh, in which Xi Jinping is largely expected to enter a third term in office as core leader. Are these past uh, events and upcoming events interrelated? And if so, how? What is China seeking to achieve in Northeast Asia? And based on this, what trajectory might we be able to expect looking forward? Given the events in Ukraine, what signs should we be looking for uh, when it comes to a potential Taiwan uh, scenario, uh, if indeed we can expect one in the near or midterm future? And finally, how might Japan and its close partners uh, help mitigate these challenges uh, as we face them? To help explore some of these questions today, I'm honored to be joined by a distinguished um, group of speakers uh, who I'll briefly introduce in their speaking order. The first is Dr. Yamaguchi Shinji, Senior Research Fellow in the Chinese Studies Division at the National Institute for Defense Studies, or NIDS, in Tokyo. His particular focus is on Chinese politics and on Chinese security policy. Second is Dr. Malcolm Davis. Malcolm is a senior analyst in defense strategy and capability at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in Canberra, or ASPI, uh, and specializes in Chinese military modernization, uh, as well as military technology, uh, as well as, of course, strategy and capability development. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Tomonori Yoshizaki, Director for Policy Simulation at NIDS, um, in Tokyo, of course, uh, his particular specialization is in alliance management, uh, NATO, uh, and conflict resolution, amongst other uh, issues. I will hand over the floor to our speakers, who will speak for no more uh, than about eight minutes each, uh, and then I'll open up the floor uh, to the questions from the audience. I encourage you all to, in the meantime, while presentations are being given already, type in and submit your questions via the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please note that this entire webinar is on the record. Um, that is both the um, actual presentations as well as the Q&A. It is also being recorded uh, and will be available on Rusi's website for those of you who unfortunately could us join, couldn't join us at this particular uh, time today. But with no further ado, uh, Mr. Uh, apologies, Dr. Yamaguchi, the floor is yours to give your intervention. Um, thanks, Vera. And thank you very much for uh, having me uh, for uh, uh, this, this webinar. It's my honor and uh, it's my pleasure to talk with you. And uh, so my uh, point is on the, uh, what is the future trajectory of China's action and what exactly is the, that uh, the China ultimately hope to achieve. Uh, I make three points. Uh, first one is about the goals and strategies of China. The second one is recent trends uh, of China's policy. And third one is on, on the uh, future trajectory. So oh, let's begin with goals and strengths. Uh, I think that the uh, China has four categories of objectives in Northeast Asia region. Uh, first one is preserving its political system. Um, it means meaning uh, this China's Communist Party's rule. That's first one. The second one is unifying Taiwan uh, and achieving the uh, unifying uh, China's Chinese nation. That's the second one. And third one is the uh, gaining the upper, upper hand or uh, priority over the against the regional powers, including China.
Oh dear, I think we have um, some connectivity problems. Um, Dr. Yamaguchi, are you there? I think you're- Oh, I'm, I'm back, sorry, I'm back. Sorry. Great, please continue. So, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and fourth one is the countering U U United States superior military uh, power and alliance networks, and uh, particularly uh, for the for the for China, uh, key is the United States. Uh, the United States is involved uh, in the all these goals. Um, uh, so ult ultimately, for China, uh, these goals are, uh, cannot be achieved uh, unless it uh, it compete with the United States. Uh, for hege hegemony in Northeast Asia. Therefore, how to weaken uh, US hegemony remains a challenge for biggest challenge for China. And uh, how to achieve these goals? Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, um, it consists of many parts, but uh, China's strategy was uh, several parts. Uh, one is to increase uh, the uh, comprehensive national power of China, uh, which includes the, not, not, not only economic, economic power, but also a military and technological and uh, political or uh, ideological power. And second one is to drive a wedge between the United States and uh, its partners or ally allies. And um, third one is the to strike some sort of deals with the United States to get uh, something very uh, important without uh, res resorting to war. Uh, but however, uh, uh, until now, up until now, China's uh, these strategies are not so working well, actually, uh, because the, for example, uh, compromises with the United States have failed and uh, China failed to establish uh, the so-called a uh, new type of great power re relationship. Uh, it, it didn't work. And also a uh, cooperation between the United States and, and its allies, uh, including Japan or South Korea, has also been uh, enhanced. So oh, uh, wedge, strategy, wedge strategy didn't work. So as a, as a result, uh, China has uh, had to rely more on the uh, coer coercive, power, coercive means, coercive power. Uh, including military and also uh, the non-military, uh, so-called non-military non means, so-called uh, the gray zone operations, uh, which uses non-military means to coerce other nations. These are the uh, the uh, basic China's goals and uh, and uh, strengths uh, strategies, and and uh, then move to the China's uh, recent uh, trends of China's policies. And I think that the, over the five, uh, these five years, China's policy towards Northeast Asian countries has become uh, considerably more uh, hawkish or hardline, hardline one. Uh, for example, for Taiwan, since the establishment of Tsai Ing-wen government, uh, the dialogue line or peaceful uh, uh, unification line has almost come to an end. And, and the uh, policy has become uh, much more uh, pressure-centered one. And uh, also towards the Japan relationship, relationship, relationship in, improved around uh, 2017 to 2019, but uh, uh, since since then uh, how, uh, deteriorated again recently. So all uh, the China's uh, relationship with uh, neighboring countries has has been deteriorated. And there are two factors contribute to the, this uh, uh, hawkish line or deteriorating uh, relationship. First one is U.S.-China rivalry, uh, because the, uh, uh, as you know, uh, U.S. had made made its uh, more con confrontational stance towards China has been more clearly, clearer, uh, especially after Trump administration and uh, Biden administration has taken over uh, the uh, continued this line in more uh, system systematic way. Um, that's the one thing. And second one is the uh, China has failed to uh, uh, enchant uh, these uh, countries. Or attracted, attracted these countries to its side. Uh, rather, China has continued to take hardline stance towards Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, uh, which has worsened relationship. Uh, during uh, the decade of Xi Jinping era, uh, Japan and Taiwan uh, and uh, South Korea have become increasingly wary of China. Uh, these are the uh, rough, uh, rough this, uh, recent trend. And sadly, uh, the so future. What 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 will be the future trajectory? Uh, I think that the chat, uh, Taiwan issue will be the uh, will remain the key for China, and and this region, and especially Speaker Pelosi's visit in last August shows the China's uh, both China's uh, both opportunities and challenges for China. Um, 
and the challenge may be uh, more obvious than the opportunity. And first, uh, China's, uh, China used Pelosi's visit to Taiwan uh, as an opportunity to expand uh, their, uh, their activities, especially it's the scope of its military exercises uh, further than before, or breaching the median line, uh, uh, and even putting the exercises area over Taiwan's claim, uh, Taiwan's claim of the uh, territorial waters. So it's, it's changed the uh, status quo. And, but on the other hand, uh, China's actions have failed to prevent the US commitment to Taiwan. Uh, since Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, many US and other uh, countries' legislators have visited Taiwan. And also uh, the United States has rather clearly shown the uh, strengthening of, of its uh, commitment to Taiwan, including the arms sales to uh, Taiwan and also passage of uh, the uh, Taiwan Policy Act by uh, the US Senate. So China basically, I think, uh, uh, failed to prevent uh, further, further US actions. Uh, and so what, what, is, what, what will be the future for? Uh, trajectory. I think that the um, uh, um, immediate Chinese uh, invasion of Taiwan is not not highly possible, but we don't we we don't we don't know uh, if it will be in the uh, ten to fifteen years uh, time span, and if the prospects of uh, peaceful peaceful uni re re reunification of Taiwan by China become less likely, and uh, military uh, superiority if uh, the U China's military superiority in the region becomes clear then the possibility of uh, invasion uh, may become, uh, by, by using force, may become uh, more, more likely. And even if it does not go, go that far, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, not, not the full-scale invasion, but the likelihood of crisis uh, happening in the future is still quite high, I think, uh, because the China is very nervous about the uh, increasing involvement uh, of, the, of the United States uh, or Europe or Japan and other countries to Taiwan. And uh, I think that the China, China uh, needs uh, more needs uh, to needs to demonstrate uh, its strengths and uh, resolve more. So we will face the. Uh, so I think that because China is failing uh, in its uh, Taiwan policy, then uh, we 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 will face the more confrontational China's policy on Taiwan, and that that will become the uh, problem for in, in this region. Thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you, Dr. Yamaguchi. Um, and to speak to us about some of those military um, developments and capabilities, I'm gonna to turn to Malcolm, who will also help um, maybe explore some of the differences and similarities between Ukraine and Taiwan and, and what we should actually be looking out for from a Chinese, I guess, movement's perspective. Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here from uh, Canberra. Um, uh, look, I think that, from the Australian perspective, uh, we see the prospect of a Chinese invasion and annexation of Taiwan as being uh, the single most important security risk that we face uh, in the coming years. Um, there's debate as to when that might happen. You know, might it happen in the second half of this decade? Uh, certainly Admiral Phil Davidson has uh, of the US Navy has suggested that. Uh, others are a little bit more cautious, saying that it could happen into the 2030s. But there is a sense uh, that I think China is committed uh, to taking Taiwan, irrespective of the wishes of the Taiwanese people. And I think that's a key point. Um, when we talk about um, so-called reunification, uh, there's a number of caveats we need to put in front of that. Firstly, uh, you know, history shows that the Chinese Communist Party has never controlled Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan uh, was handed over to Japan uh, in the Treaty of Shimonoseki in the late 19th century, and then at the end of the Second World War was returned to the then government of China, which was, of course, Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists, who then lost power in 1949 and fled to the island of Formosa, which is Taiwan. So uh, there's, a, there's a dubious claim on the part of the Chinese Communist Party to controlling Taiwan in the first place. But the second point I would make is that the vast majority of the Taiwanese people don't want to become uh, part of China, the People's Republic of China. Uh, you know, countless polls have shown that. So we face a situation um, in terms of thinking about Taiwan, where a, a, a liberal democracy of 24 million people um, is facing the prospect of being forcibly annexed and incorporated into an authoritarian state against their will. 
And that raises all sorts of ethical and moral implications for us in the region and for the United States. Um, and it raises obviously geostrategic and economic factors as well as to you know, whether strategic ambiguity, which is the current US policy regarding Taiwan, whether that is outliving its usefulness. And in fact, we should be uh, laying down some markers in terms of what we will do in the event that China does decide to use force against Taiwan. I think it's fairly obvious that, that at some point they will, uh, because the, the prospects for peaceful unification between Taiwan and China, where essentially Taiwan accepts the 1992 consensus, which is Beijing's terms for unification, are dwindling fast, especially when the Taiwanese look at what is happening in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs and also in Hong Kong uh, with the suppression of democracy there. The Taiwanese people don't want to be part of that society. And China understands this, Xi Jinping understands this. And so from Beijing's perspective, the chances of, of peaceful unification uh, are running out. So where does that leave China? in terms of their options going forward. And this, this lets me get to the questions at hand, which is the military side of things. Um, we look at what's happening with Ukraine, where Russia has uh, ruthlessly carried out an invasion of its neighbor, and it's now essentially paying a heavy price in terms of a military defeat. I think the Chinese will be looking at what the Russians have done in Ukraine and understanding what not to do in any invasion of Taiwan. And certainly I think that they will try initially to use a strategy of coercion over the coming years to try and essentially undermine the resolve of the Taiwanese government and the Taiwanese people uh, and bend them ultimately to accept uh, Beijing's 1992 consensus as a basis for unification. I think that effort will fail uh, because the Taiwanese people, as I said, understand the consequences of going back uh, into uh, essentially a Chinese uh, communist, uh, uh, communist run China. So at a certain point, um, Xi Jinping, assuming he is uh, in, uh, still in office as, as essentially president for life, which we'll find out in a few weeks time, um, he will then face a choice. Uh, in terms of you know, how he uh, proceeds with uh, seeking to incorporate uh, Taiwan back into China. And it is essential from his perspective that he do this because he has invested so much political credibility uh, in terms of his grip on power and more broadly, the Chinese Communist Party's grip on power that they have to take Taiwan. Uh, they have no choice. They can't back off from it. So therefore, I do see the scenario emerging where you will see a gradual ramp up of military activity across the Taiwan Straits in coming years. I think the Pelosi visit has um, opened the door to make that happen. Uh, it's changed the, the environment, uh, the operational environment, changed the political environment to enable the PLA to start increasing uh, the sorts of military drills to extend the military drills across the median line to be more aggressive and to ultimately lay the basis for what could start out as a as a black blockade strategy to isolate Taiwan prior to any actual invasion of Taiwan itself that could occur as early as the second half of this decade uh, or potentially as late as into the middle of the next decade. I don't think they are going to wait until 2049 before they do this. Um, I think the objective of the, of the PLA activity is, as I said, to break the will, uh, to signal to Taiwan uh, China's determination to, to essentially force it into Chinese control and to also test uh, Taiwanese and Japanese defenses and, and also Western responses uh, every time they do these, these sorts of exercises across uh, Taiwan's air defense identification zone and now across the median uh, line, they gather useful information on Taiwanese capabilities and responses in terms of their radar systems, their C2 capabilities, their air defense systems and so forth. All of that is really vital. So I would fully expect that in the next few years, you will see uh, that sort of activity pick up across the Taiwan Straits and it will become 
a veritable hornet's nest of PLA operations across uh, that body of water. Um, I do think that ultimately um, they'll try to coerce, go start, as I said, starting potentially with blockade, but they could also look to take offshore territories such as Pratas Island or Itu Aba, um, Kin Men, um, and various different others, Kamoi Matsu. All of these islands, uh, in particular Kamoi Matsu and Kin Men, are heavily defended. And so the question in my mind is, what does that actually achieve for Beijing in the sense that they might take these uh, offshore territories at great cost, but then still not have the main prize, which is Taiwan itself. So that's why I don't think they'll be satisfied with just grabbing some offshore territories. I think ultimately what they'll seek is to take Taiwan itself. And there we are talking about uh, the joint uh, landing campaign type operation for the PLA, to do a cross straits invasion uh, at a, in a joint manner. And that's going to be probably the most challenging military operation they've ever done and potentially the most costly. There was a series of war games that were held in Washington DC just recently uh, where it was gamed out you know, how the US would respond in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Uh, the war game suggested that the US and its allies in, in the region, including Australia and Japan, uh, could potentially blunt any invasion, but at great cost to uh, US forces, including the loss of carriers and so forth. And I think a key point here that I want to make is that we should not make the mistake of assuming that any cross straits invasion will be a fast, short operation. Um, we could be talking here about protracted war lasting months, if not longer. Because from Beijing's perspective, uh, taking Taiwan is an essential requirement. They must achieve that outcome. And if they are pushed back by um, either Taiwanese forces or US and allied forces in the outset, they must try again. So they would return from having their nose bloody coming back again to try again. Likewise, for the Americans, if they choose to intervene, uh, they cannot afford to accept China militarily taking Taiwan because that would be an incredible blow to their strategic credibility in the region. Uh, and essentially, um, the, they, the, they're an Indo-Pacific power. They have to have maintained that forward presence. So I do think the prospect for protracted war lasting months rather than days or weeks is a real one that we need to think about. Um, I think in terms of patterns of behavior that observers um, we should be playing, playing uh, close attention to, um, I think that clearly uh, we need to watch what the PLA Navy are doing with amphibious operations. Um, the already they're using uh, maritime militia, um, ferries, commercial ferries, uh, and uh, other types of craft to practice amphibious operations, how do you get troops across that body of water, uh, particularly when PLA Navy itself doesn't necessarily have at this point in time, the amphibious capability to carry out uh, an invasion. And that's where we come into dates once again, uh, you know, perhaps by 2027, it has been suggested that the PLA will have the actual means to carry out a cross straits invasion. That's also the 100th anniversary of the PLA itself. So I think that that period, 2026 to 2027 is highly significant. Um, whether they actually do it at that point is uncertain, but that's the point we should be starting to think about rather than thinking, you know, you know um, fanciful ideas about somehow it'll happen in the late 20, mid 2040s. Um, I think other areas that, that we'll be focusing on in terms of PLA development obviously is in terms of long range air power, uh, perfecting their submarine operations as the submarines get quieter, uh, counter space operations which are already being developed to be able to attack US and allied space capabilities and of course cyber and electronic warfare. Um, so there's a range of other, other issues that, that I could certainly address but, but I, I'll finish up with these points. Um, I do think that we are probably on a path towards an eventual Chinese invasion of Taiwan 
It may not succeed initially, but it could lead to a protracted war lasting months between the US and its allies on the one hand and China on the other. It's absolutely vital that the US does respond to any Chinese invasion, because if it fails to respond, if it basically abandons Taiwan, then we're talking about a, a nation of 24 million people in a Western in, in a liberal democracy, um, basically being absorbed into an authoritarian state against their will. And that has huge consequences for the strategic stability for the region beyond Taiwan, because China's ambitions do not stop at Taiwan. Uh, from Taiwan, if they control that, they can pivot north to project power into the Ryukyus and Okinawa. They can pivot south to more effectively dominate the Philippines uh, and ultimately project power out into the Pacific to threaten Guam and even Hawaii. So it is the key strategic challenge of our, our era um, and providing that Ukraine uh, doesn't end in nuclear war, which un is uncertain at this point, um, Taiwan is the next crisis that we face and we have to be ready for it. And I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. I'm going to turn it over to Tom to talk to us about what Japan and partners and allies should really do to help mitigate um, this kind of upcoming uh, tension and potentially upcoming invasion scenario. Uh, further uh, down the line uh, in the kind of mid to, to near term uh, or mid to long term horizon, I should say. Tom, over to you. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you very much for having me. And I'm Yoshizaki. A previous job was the Director of Policy Simulation. Now I'm assuming the post of Vice, Direct, uh, Vice President of this to oversee this kind of strategic trends. And very, I'm ha very happy to talk about my personal take. And uh, Lucy prepared a very tough three question. Number one question is how Japan and myself will analyze the military situation, especially side of Russia, uh, the joint drill and uh, collaboration strategic partners type of things. Number two is that NATO had a new strategic concept and Japan is now preparing the three strategic documents. So that means we have to have a new strategic thinking, what we like, my take. The last one, at least, is the, what will be the partnership based upon these burning issues and a very volatile situation, how Japan can envision the uh, like-minded partner to be enhanced. And uh, the Maguchi-san and uh, Davis, uh, they focused on Taiwan issues. Uh, I would like to uh, make some comment about Taiwan issue from um, the uh, simulation perspective. Number one question is that how uh, we should analyze new trends in this kind of Far East nuclear district. And the comparison between 2018 post talk and this time 2022 post talk this month uh, was significant. And in uh, let me use a 5H, uh, the starting from when, where, who, and what, and why. And when uh, this was uh, decided and implemented. Okay, previous original idea was to start all 30, 30. But uh, one day delayed, even though we have a fleet from other uh, countries. And uh, so that was sudden kind of um, the change of schedule and uh, we were somewhat upset. So that may be some of the reason the mismanagement may be happening or the cost of coordination of this kind of 13 participating country drill in the first time in history. And uh, but regular the um, exercises holding by Russia in this region is a signal even after the Ukraine a chaotic situation that might mean that the Russian military is determined to move ahead even during the Ukraine the uh, turmoil. Number two issues where they had a military exercise that's very symbolic. Four years back, it was land-based military exercise. The PLA and the Mongolia was a major player. This time, well, including the waters around the northern territories. And also, the, basically, this is the maritime domain. That thing, 
this location is a kind of the new shift in uh, the Russia or Chinese support to this one. And uh, who? Uh, China came, India, and the Belarus. So we'd like to, that might highlight the new trend that the CSTO or SCO are kind of another Russian partnership in uh, like minded partners. Well, NATO or EU or Japan love the term like a like minded partners. Now it is the Russian time turn or Chinese turn to envision, well, the strategies partner for life or the like-minded partners according to their calculation. And don't forget the CSTO has a so-called corrective defense codes and obligations. And after the Afghanistan turmoil, they put in, Mr. Putin reiterated his intentions about the, the escalation, including the use of force and during the CSTO type of exercises. And last two questions, what and why? What what are they aiming at? The first one on top of my head is Russia and China would like to have a strategic, very clear strategic communication that every four years to have a joint drill, even after Ukraine, and also have a wider ties beyond this region, like India and Belarus, to try to be global and how about African supports. And so the, the scale of the exercise shrank rapidly. Originally, uh, four years back, 300,000. This time, 50,000, it was it shrunk. But it is very symbolic that the, they would like to be global. OK, let me move on to that second question, implication for alliance management and extended deterrence during the Ukraine crisis and enhanced strategic partnership between Beijing and Moscow. And that the real challenge. Number one issue is that credibility of extended deterrence is definitely needed. Especially the article five must be iron cut, either in the European theater, in the Indo-Pacific theater. In that sense, we have the same strategic messages. This time in Madrid, the Finland, the Sweden, uh, the formerly and uh, historically uh, neutral country find interest of having the ties with NATO and have a membership. That means the alliance is secure and also have a higher evaluation across the region. That's a very positive sign. But when it's come to the Ukraine, seamless response is definitely needed. So we needed to have deterrence by de deployment, deterrence by coercion, new type of the deterrence and the concept is definitely needed. So we must be very active. Let me move on to the last and most critical question. What will be the partners with the issues for Japan? and for Australia and for NATO, for EU and for UK. The number one issue is that as Davis clearly uh, uh, sent the message that uh, coercion is critical and the plot, protracted warfare. So no short war, but what matter in this situation is in one word, resilience. Our long-term support to resilience of the targeted country, like in the case of the European theater, Ukraine. In our region, possibly Taiwan could be a target, not the country, but that's the reason. And plus, capacity building endeavor, along with the ASEAN country and like-minded country, including Australia and New Zealand and also NATO, would be critical in order to foster the sense and level of enhanced level of resilience across the region, connectivity, logic support, economic, economic uh, the, uh, lines of communications, these seamless network is critical because the warfare or conflict will continue and protracted and coercion will be included. In that sense, we should have a like-mindedness at the very high level plus long-term goal to be shared by like-minded countries. Well, let me conclude with a much more concrete suggestion 
Number one is that Japan, Australia successfully agreed on RAA, the Sposco Access Agreement. And that could be the template for UK, Germany, and NATO having a seamless uh, communication, information sharing. It is not an alliance matter, but it is a typical example of successful in employment of our forces, plus a dealing with the long-term resilience. I'm sure that uh, this is a clear challenge for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was um, a fascinating um, intervention and, and thank you for those critical uh, and practical um, uh, suggestions and recommendations as well. We're gonna open it up to the floor um, for the Q&A. We've got about 25 minutes um, to get through uh, really a, a host of different questions. Um, maybe uh, just one question to start off with. Um, there's quite a few questions around um, the kind of economics of it all. So how is um, China's current economic stability or lack thereof um, impacting the, the potential timeline uh, or uh, capabilities of China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? Um, how does this uh, you know, uh, link in with the Belt and Road? There's conversations there around debt as well. Uh, and then finally, um, in terms of uh, China's economic growth, which is of course slowing down, um, how does that impact uh, the, the ability to really absorb Taiwan kind of long-term as well? So does anyone want to, uh, to, to respond to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, look, I think that, you know, as China's economy continues to slow, particularly, you know, in the face of, you know, uh, significant internal domestic, you know, sort of challenges, which the Chinese Communist Party doesn't seem to be addressing, and also obviously the impacts of COVID as well. Um, the pressure on the Chinese Communist Party to, to, to sort of generate success uh, will increase. You know, the Chinese Communist Party after the Tiananmen Square massacre uh, made essentially a deal with the Chinese people, which basically said, put your uh, ambitions for political reform on uh, to one side and we'll give you prosperity and growth uh, in return in, in for keeping us in power. Well, if that if that growth and that prosperity is is the essential requirement for the CCP's legitimacy and grip on power, and that goes away, then you know they are in trouble. So I think they would turn more nationalist. Uh, they would turn to uh, the issue of Taiwan. It's more you know slowing economic growth is more likely to pr prompt. Xi Jinping to actually be more aggressive and assertive in regards to Taiwan and indeed other areas of dispute in the South China Sea and the East China Sea and elsewhere. So I think that, you know, uh, on the one hand, fast ec economic growth gives China greater ability to modernize at a faster pace. Um, slower economic growth makes it more likely that they'll use military force uh, to achieve their goals uh, in the region. Yes, Shinji. Um, I think that the uh, one of the uh, China, uh, the most concerning issue for China is the uh, potential U.S. sanctions, especially on the uh, financial sanctions. Uh, Ch China is really, really uh, worried about the uh, th that point. And uh, now, uh, after the uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, China is really closely closely watch the what, what what will happen, what will happen uh, for for Moscow. Uh, so it, it is really uh, care. Uh, China is really uh, care about the uh, pot potential uh, confrontation with the United States on the economic issue. Tom, are you nothing to add to that? Well, just a quick note that uh, Ukraine China economy ties is very strong, used to be very strong. And uh, so in that sense, China may find uh, the dilemma of supporting Ukraine while having a strategic partners. Then we may have some chance to do that. Thank you. There are a few questions around the differences between Ukraine and Taiwan, particularly, of course, the fact that Taiwan has limited international diplomatic recognition as a state. Um, you know, there's questions around to what extent the two are really comparable uh, and what impact this would have uh, on European US or even Asian responses to a potential uh, Taiwan scenario. Um, 
perhaps Shinji, is this something that I can and turn to you about? And then um, maybe Tom and, and Malcolm as well. Sure. Uh, I think that the uh, one of the difference uh, between China, China, no, not China, Taiwan and U Ukraine is that the Taiwan is island uh, and Ukraine is uh, part of the uh, continent. And, and the, it's really a big, big thing because the uh, uh, in the Ukraine case, uh, other European countries can help uh, by land, land uh, using the road or uh, uh, the train or some such kind of things. But in the case of uh, Taiwan, uh, China may be able to uh, Block uh, the uh, the assist, assistance for, for for Taiwan by Japan or United States. Uh, so the, that such kind of blockade scenario could be possible. That, that, that is the uh, b biggest difference, I think. And um, but there there are many similarities as well. Also, also uh, for, uh, especially a big one is the. I think that both China and Russia has a, con a con uh, concept of warfare is like the uh, quick, uh, cost-effective warfare uh, by the uh, by using the uh, non-military non means like the uh, 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 great gray zone scenario or um, that, that is a very very similar one and uh, maybe uh, U.S. support can help uh, can help uh, the. Uh, help Taiwan to uh, resist uh, more effectively to China in, in the case of China's invasion. Okay, okay let me uh, respond. The first the similarity and the differences between Taiwan case and, and uh, the uh, Ukraine case. Uh, the, in my mind, the most the critical differences is uh, the guarantee provided by United States. And uh, as to the U Ukraine, the NATO clearly declared the rule out to the possible option. Number one is that no flight zone. Number two is the deployment of the missile forces there in the Ukraine. For the, and uh, the, they reiterated the escalation risk involved. But uh, in case of Taiwan Republic of China, they used to be a uh, partner as of alliance upon 1979, plus the unilateral security assurances, and also provision of the weaponry uh, for many years. And also the crisis is not the uh, totally new. It is a historically very deep one and uh, crisis management experiences is all. And, but the another critical the strategic differences is uh, so-called strategic depth the Ukraine is huge and Taiwan is quite close and uh, tiny compared to the Ukraine, the vast Tehran. In that sense, what matter would the, the will of escalation and hold to the resilience the status of the targeted area? Also, yeah. Yeah, I would add in to the the other speakers' comments. Obviously, you know the difference. You know, in terms of ge geography matters. Um, but you know the interesting thing here with Taiwan is that the Chinese would be employing an anti-access and error denial capability that stretches deep into the Pacific um, and denies the US and its allies the ability to operate close to Taiwan during wartime. In Ukraine, the Russians have not done that. They've not sought to deny NATO the ability to, to operate close to Ukraine. So you, NATO have had the ability to supply Ukraine with all sorts of military hardware, as well as fly intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platforms close to Ukraine to gather intelligence and provide that intelligence to Ukraine. We wouldn't have that luxury in the case of Taiwan. And that does suggest to me that, you know, if we want to essentially support Taiwan uh, by providing military hardware to make it more difficult for the Chinese to attack and thus uh, increase the credibility uh, and effectiveness of deterrence against an attack, uh, then we should be arming Taiwan sooner rather than trying to wait until the war begins and then somehow getting the weapons to Taiwan through China's anti-access and air denial capabilities. I think you know, doing that is, is, a, is a losing strategy in, in a Taiwan context. That's really interesting. Can I just actually follow up on that? Um, because you know, in this discussion, there's also been a question, for example, on political will. Um, uh, political will and also public opinion and how that matters. I mean, how do you maybe Malcolm see this playing out in Australia and maybe from a US perspective and then Tom uh, and Shinji, how do you see this um, in Japan and maybe the wider region uh, in the Indo-Pacific as well? 
or indeed from NATO or, or a European perspective? I'd be very keen for your thoughts. Well, I, I think in Australia, there's there's yet to be a broad discussion amongst the people about how we respond to a Taiwan crisis. There's an ongoing discussion in the strategic policy community, which I'm part of, which is happening all the time. Uh, our defence policy is increasingly being shaped around the challenge posed by China. And, and of course, that focuses very much on Taiwan. But even there, there's yet to be a formal uh, policy debate about how we would respond to a Taiwan Straits crisis. Uh, you know, we have um, a one China uh, policy, uh, which recognizes China, uh, the People's Republic of China as China, uh, and we acknowledge the PRC's claim to Taiwan, but that does not necessarily mean we support it. Okay, so um, there is some gray zone there for us to actually deal with in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, because we do not see necessarily that Taiwan is part of China. Um, we acknowledge the claim to Taiwan, but we don't necessarily see Taiwan as part of China, which is different to China's one China principle that they keep on pushing at us. Um, but certainly there is a, 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 a debate that's beginning to get underway about how we would respond. I think you're seeing the same thing happening in the US with Biden now saying four times that um, the US would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion. His White House staff have walked back those comments and, and retreated into strategic ambiguity each time. But I think that there's now more and more discussion about, well, has strategic ambiguity outlived its usefulness and do we need to start thinking more about a declaratory policy that we will defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion? I think Australia is going down that path and I wouldn't speak for the Japanese. So I would let our, my colleagues from Tokyo uh, give their points on that. Thank you, Davis. And uh, oh, the, I've, we've seen a sea changes in strategic culture and public support is radically changing. And uh, traditional taboo may be going away. For example, GDP 1% ceiling of the Japanese defense uh, budget uh, set in 1976. And it was a very conservative kind of target. Now it may be going away. And, as, and there are some other proposals that uh, we should double the budget or more. And number two is that thinking about the unthinkable or kind of um, thinking out of the box. This is a kind of new situation by strategic surprises by Ukraine and Taiwan crisis. So something can happen. So previously, Japanese strategic culture was very conservative. Okay, kind of inch by inch and uh, trying to have a kind of a stasis and that uh, very uh, reactive, not the uh, active. But now we see that the deterrence may be challenged. So deterrence by denial was very popular, but we now know that it is not enough. So we have to think out of the box, deterrence by denial and possibly by punishments if needed, or combination in between. Then we have to think about the capability to make a counterattack if some if deterrence failures. So thinking about unthinkable is a new trend and we cannot get away. Um, I think that the Japan's uh, public and policy debate on Taiwan's uh, scenario is blooming right now, um, suddenly, actually. Um, but uh, for us, uh, I think that the uh, Japan will be, uh, will be attacked, possibly, uh, Japan may be attacked by, uh, by, by, by PLA in the case of uh, invasion of Taiwan, because, uh, because we have uh, the US bases in, in, in Okinawa or other, other places, and, and which, which, which may be the first, first responder to, uh, to Taiwan case by, by United States. So uh, it is actually uh, the natural uh, thing to, uh, that for us to think about that, that, that point. But still, I think that the uh, our uh, level of debate is not so uh, how, how should I say mature yet uh, because the, it's it's uh, it was not so uh, center of our discussion uh, until recently. 
That's why uh, former Prime Minister Abe, Abe san uh, uh, re repeatedly mentioned that the uh, Taiwan's defense, Taiwan's security is Japan's security. So we, 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 we still we need to uh, some, some kind of um, how should I say, education or, or enlightenment about that point. Thank you. Could I actually just ask all three of you as well? I mean, in terms of uh, a Taiwan scenario, do you think that China would be tempted to also uh, target U.S. capabilities in Japan, or is this too provocative? I mean, how do you see that that playing out, Malcolm, uh, and then Shinji? Yeah, there's there's two uh, sort of like models of a, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. The first is sort of like a a fait accompli scenario where the Chinese do a lightning invasion of Taiwan, hold it, uh, and basically then dare the, the the US and its allies to intervene. Um, I think that's that model is becoming less and less likely. The other model where the Chinese basically expect US intervention, and so therefore launch preemptive strikes against US forces across the region, not just in Japan, but also elsewhere through the Indo-Pacific region, including against Australia. Um, I think is much more likely. Um, and that kind of turns on the assumption that the PLA can uh, basically defend against uh, US intervention through the effective use of anti-access and error denial capabilities um, and basically inflict sufficient cost and damage on US forces and allied forces that ultimately they will be deterred from intervening. So I think that the, the second scenario of, of uh, Chinese attacks across the region against US and allied forces um, is, is the more likely one. Uh, and that would involve, you know, sort of mass launch of, of long range missiles with conventional warheads uh, against uh, US forces and, and their allies, including fixed bases, to essentially deny them the ability to operate close to um, Chinese territory. Um, military speaking, I completely agree with uh, Malcolm's comment. I think that the, uh, yeah, RPS, uh, I think now China sees, sees the US involvement as involvement, military intervention by United States as a uh, given, I think. So, so uh, which, which means that the, they need to prevent US access uh, and US activities in this region. And then uh, attacking uh, the uh, US bases is really uh, high priority. But uh, secondly, a uh, big question is that military speaking, it's really uh, effective one. But still, a uh, big question is China really would really would uh, do that because it's really complicated. Uh, 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 it's com it, it will, will complicate the situation uh, and it will, will become the big war in, in this region uh, involving Japan and uh, may, maybe Australia or other countries. So that is the uh, huge, big uh, issue, I think. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, Tom, if you have anything to add, otherwise there are other questions. Yep, over to you. Yep. Okay. My take about the how to respond to the so-called Taiwan crisis is to go to the dime approach, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. It cannot be separated. This comprehensive approach will be the sources of a strength and partnership because we have a wider partnership than Beijing and Moscow. So we can maintain so-called external light of uh, the uh, lines of communication supply chains. So what matter with the resilience of the Taiwan and also that is a very polit politically, what should I say, okay approach. Uh, in the other words, this is a very delicate situation because we have so many do's and don'ts vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. So how we can better deal with the so-called hybrid or gray zone situation? My solution at this moment is the resilience of the Taiwan through time comprehensive approach in uh, like-minded uh, like partners. That's, that's very interesting. In, in terms of, um, I wanna to touch on two things. One, you know, in terms of the strategic approach, is that still useful or not? I mean, if we move away from the strategic approach, do we also then need to set red lines? And what would those red lines be, particularly if you know China is employing gray zone tactics? So um, if one of you could answer that, that would be great. Raise your hand if you're interested. Um, another is um, another angle that I think we haven't explored yet is what does Taiwan really need? We've talked about, you know, arming Taiwan has been mentioned. Um, 
resilience has been mentioned, what are we actually talking about? How do we assess the current state of, of Taiwanese um, self-defense capabilities? Who would like to go first? Malcolm. Um, well, look, I'll take the second question first, uh, I think. Um, what do they need? Uh, I don't think they necessarily need high-end military capabilities like F-35s and, and guided missile destroyers and so forth. I think what they need is asymmetric capabilities, the sorts of capabilities that the Ukrainians have been using to great effect. Uh, so I'm not necessarily <clears throat> talking about you know, javelins and things like that, but I am talking about um, land-based anti-ship missile systems, naval mine capabilities to inflict as much damage on a Chinese naval, excuse me, a naval amphibious force uh, crossing the straits. Um, much greater use of drones and loitering munitions. Uh, you know, that's something that the Chinese, that the Taiwanese should be all over in terms of what coming out of Ukraine, how drones and loitering munitions have played a huge role there. Um, <clears throat> systems like HIMARS, for example, um, I think are really important. Long range fires, the ability to be, to be able to strike um, at Chinese forces in their ports before they can even depart. Uh, would be something that that I would also suggest would be important. Um, but the worry is that they want, you know, sort of high-end, you know, the multi-million dollar jet fighters and frigates and, and things like that, which ultimately um, are not going to sort of be su sufficient in numbers to be able to inflict the necessary sort of cost on Chinese forces. So they need a low cost, um, um, high payoff system that basically generates that high cost on Chinese forces prior to or as they're crossing the straits, rather than investing in exquisite capabilities in very limited numbers. Okay. Uh, my focus is the value of strategic communication, including NATO partners, European Union partners, and Indo-Pacific partners in order to maximize the value of reputation, international reputation, because the Ukraine crisis highlighted the uh, multi-dimensional crisis, not only military, not only territorial one, but the economy or financial or reputations. And another, the, uh, the addition is that, okay, WMD issues. Ukraine case had the risk of escalation and of uh, targeting the WMD. And uh, also NATO had to communicate, criticizing that situation, plus kind of new uh, tilt for extended deterrence, not only for members, but also partners with the gravest concerns about the WMD safety. And uh, this is a very important message which is uh, they receive because uh, in our region, we may have a uh, Fukushima and some other WMD issues still, then China and other country had this kind of risk and potential. Then we have to go back to basic, that is the nuclear safety must be secured. So nobody can make a big move to attack WMD installations. So then have a kind of more focused on cost imposing strategy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other countries. Shinji, um, do you want to come in? Uh, really quick one. Um, I'm really uh, in, uh, interested in the, um, as Marco mentioned, the uh, pro 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 protracted Russian scenario. And I think that it, for Taiwan, it is really important to prepare for the uh, this this type of uh, warfare, uh, pro pro more pro protracted one, uh, which which needs the uh, resilient re reserve, syst reserve systems or uh, urban warfare capabilities. Um, I just, thank you. Fantastic. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. There are still so many questions um, that unfortunately we weren't able to get to, um, but uh, I'm sure that uh, our, our audience will join me in thanking you so much for your time today and for your fantastic interventions. Um, I think we could have easily spoken an, an additional few hours. So you know what, we'll have to think about that for a future occasion. And um, we'll certainly uh, like to keep the conversation with you going. Um, and here uh, at the Indo-Pacific program, as I mentioned, we will have three more webinars um, on the theme of uh, Indo-Pacific security. The next one will be on 12 October from 11 a.m. to noon GMT. And we will be talking about uh, the Liz Truss uh, administration or government 
uh, as the new government in place in the UK and how she will balance Euro-Atlantic security and Indo-Pacific security. For now, thank you so much again, gentlemen. Thank you for our audience and take care.